much. Okay, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to assemble, to uh, hear from your word, Father. We pray, God, uh, as we look at uh, current events and the, the things that are transforming the world, Lord, even as we speak, God, that you would give us uh, eyes to see through the lenses of truth of your word, God, that we perceive it, we would understand the forces behind it, we would be able to categorize the events that not only are occurring, but that will occur, and that we leave here convinced, Father, that your word is true, and Lord, that we would see Jesus Christ as sovereign, as King, as Savior, who died on the cross for our sins, who was buried, and who rose again the third day to give us everlasting life. Thank you, Father. Bless our time with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so <clears throat> in preparation for tonight, I, uh, I was, uh, I'm always trying to think in terms of a framework so, so that when an event happens or, or you see something in the news, that there's a category or an understanding that I can plug it into in the scriptures and I can categorize an event and say, this is what the Bible has to say about this event. And so I thought tonight I would kind of expand, and we've kind of done this a little bit uh, back in February, uh, but I wanted to expand on this so that we can not only look back over the events of 2020, I think we've had enough uh, earth-shaking events in the, in the first uh, five months of 2020 to make up for about 10 years of time. Uh, and so, but it's going to continue, it's going to keep coming. Is someone coming in the back door? So I want to have this framework established. Um, you know what, where's my flicker? Uh, at some point on the screen. good, how are you? Oops. Oh, yeah. Okay, fortunately, I don't have to. Uh, all right, that is again. Okay. So I wanted to look and, and put things in, in a framework, a chronology, or not really a chronology, but, but a way that we can catalog and categorize the events that we're going to see unfold, not only that have occurred up to this point, but that are going to continue to come down the pipeline uh, in the days, weeks, and months to come. So I thought in terms of, first of all, uh, if you look here on the, on the upper left hand, the cause. The cause, the spiritual winds that are blowing the, the, the events on the surface of the planet. What are the winds that we can look at that are filling the sails of, of the, the leadership of the world and, and, and humanity in general? And then we can look at the actual, the, the global, we call it the global birth pangs. The actual events that we can see on the news, that we can, we can see our president get up and speak or an event that occurs somewhere in the world. <clears throat> something that we can see and, and experience in the material realm. And I want to categorize those into these seven different uh, categories. Uh, and so we can go forward from here and then begin to think through this prism as we observe these things uh, unfolding. Uh, this again, is, this is a timeline going forward as, as usual. The red arrow points to today. It's got our date here, May 15th, 2020. Uh, and then we are going moving forward. The next major event on the prophetic timeline is the rapture of the church. The, the blue arrow here. I need one of those long sticks like a teacher had in the old days. Um, and uh, the rapture of the church is imminent. It could happen before we finish our meeting today. Uh, we do not know the day nor the hour, but we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return for the church. That is the, bo the body of believers around the world to take us out of the world before His wrath comes upon the world. So we have that assurance that it's called the blessed hope for a reason, right? It's not just a, a, a fancy moniker. It, there's a reason it's called the blessed hope. The Lord is going to take us out of this world before His wrath is poured out upon it. So, let's get into... Um, 
the, the, the cause, the spiritual winds uh, that are blowing the circumstances, that are stirring up the circumstances on the top side of the planet. And to begin with, let's look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. The scripture reads, it says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth or prevents, let's see, I've got the word, um, what does it say there? Verse 7, it says, restrains. He that restrains, uh, he who now restrains will he be taken out of the way. Okay. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now restrains will continue to restrain until he is taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, that wicked one, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now the context of this passage is speaking of the revelation or the unveiling of the Antichrist. Uh, earlier he's called uh, the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So the Antichrist will ultimately, after his, uh, remember he will receive a mortal wound and he will, his mortal wound will be healed. It will be a counterfeit resurrection. He will, he will be a counterfeit Messiah. And at that point, in the middle of the, of the tribulation period, of the day of the Lord's wrath, which is over to the right of the, the blue rapture uh, depiction, he will demand the worship of mankind. And that, is, of course, is when he will issue the mark in the right hand or in the forehead, the mark of the beast. Um, Thank God the church, we will not be here to witness those things. But anyway, this is speaking of the restrainer or the Holy Spirit who is restraining the Antichrist. The Antichrist will not be made manifest or known until the Holy Spirit is moved out of the way. Now, in the past I used to think of it as a sudden thing, like, like the Holy Spirit has been suppressing, 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 and then boom, he's gone, and then he pops up all the way to the surface. But now I view it in the sense of a progressive release, a progressive removal. So the, the mystery of iniquity is working and working and working and working in the world. It's, it's setting the stage. The stage is being set. Pieces are being maneuvered. And the Spirit of God is moving and allowing more and more and more lawlessness, more wickedness to advance in humanity. And then ultimately it will reach a point where the Spirit of God will be removed out of the way at the appropriate time. He'll be removed and the man of sin will then be revealed. He will come forth into the, onto the world stage and he will be recognized. Uh, right now, uh, you know, I, I, I'm torn. I... I, I, I I don't know if, if the church, if we're going to see the Antichrist or not, uh, and identify who he is. I'm not sure. Uh, but he will not be revealed to the world stage uh, until the Holy Spirit moves out of the way. So the point what I'm making is, first of all, the restrainer is being removed until that final point where it says, okay, now the Antichrist is free to manifest himself to be revealed. Yeah. Does, uh, so does does he reveal himself as as Satan, or is he hidden until until the very end? Oh yeah, he he will never reveal that he is empowered by Satan. He's not gonna it's not gonna be overt. It's just gonna be he, he'll exalt himself. So to me that seems like you know coward coward cowardness. Well, I mean he's being smart about it. But also it kind of shows him by where he stands compared to Jesus, where Jesus confronted the world yeah. um, and acknowledged that he is a son of man. Yeah. Yeah, and well, I mean, it's like today, you know, a Satanist, a pure Satanist even is deceived. There's always deception. A pure Satanist thinks, hey, I'm getting this power. Satan is greater than God. Uh, you know, he's the God of this world and he's giving me power and so I can... I can trust him and we'll be victorious, you know.
course, it's all deception. Satan is a deceiver, the father of lies. We'll get to that in a second. So, and the reason I, I, I point this out is so that we understand the spiritual things. The stage that's being set, I believe, is in proportion to the removal, the progressive removal of the Holy Spirit or the, the moving back and allowing uh, say, uh, evil to fill the void there. And then ultimately, the Spirit of God will say, okay, no more restraint, and the man of sin will rise up. Now, you see a picture of this in Romans chapter 1, where you see the spiral or the descent of man. Uh, you see in three different instances, as humanity suppresses the truth and unrighteousness, that God says, okay, he allows it for a time, and then he says, okay, I'm going to remove this first barrier. I'm going to let you be you. I'm going to surrender, or I'm going to yield you to your own self. It says, He gave them over to. And the Lord gave them over to. The Lord gave them up to. And so basically, He's allowing them freedom to exercise the lusts of their heart. And of course, the ultimate end of that is the reprobate mind. And that's what we're getting to right now. A global condition of the reprobate mind. A mind that cannot perceive truth, that will not perceive truth. Uh, and, and so we see in Romans 1 a progressive removal of God's restraint upon humanity. And that's why I believe the same thing is happening today in terms of the Antichrist. Because now we are, we are setting the stage now for, uh, for the government to be in place for him to take over. Uh, we're setting the stage now with the vaccination and the, the micro dot technology, the marking technology that will come with that virus or with that uh, uh, vaccine, uh, the capacity to mark the skin and, and track people, and of course, the global scope. I mean, they're very ambitious. They want to uh, vaccinate the entire world, every human being. And that should send red warning flags out right there. So, so the first thing is we understand is that the Spirit of God is, is backing away from humanity, allowing evil to fill the vacuum and prepare this, the world stage for the rise, the unveiling of Antichrist. Now look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Ephesians 6, 12. Um, we have in Ephesians 6, 12... Our spiritual warfare. Paul writes, he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world or this age. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I thought this was a very appropriate text to demonstrate, first of all, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, why would Paul have to say that? Well, he would have to say that because we are confronted with flesh and blood enemies. It is the puppets of Satan, the pawns of Satan, who we have face-to-face -face contact with. When they come and they knock on the door and you see a, practically a tank outside and they <laughs> this, this, this burly dude like Leonard in a military uniform and a syringe... Um, uh, you know, they're not there to help you. <laughs> they're there to force you down and to take a shot. Uh, now, I don't know if it'll be that dramatic, uh, but there will be certainly... Uh, let's just say there's going to be consequences for saying no to the, this coming global vaccine. But so the natural thought is, this is the guy I'm, I'm opposed to. This guy, uh, this leader, the, this group of leaders, when in reality they are the... They are simply responding to the spiritual forces, the unseen spiritual forces that are compelling them to do the things that they're due, to, to be the, the agents of, of spiritual darkness. And that's what it says. Our wrestling is against a principality. These are spiritual principalities or rulers. Against the powers, the authorities. Again, there is a spiritual hierarchy that leads all the way up to Satan. And these demonic minions are carrying out at very level, various levels of authority and various levels of, of power. They are carrying out the will of Satan and ultimately they interface with human beings. Just as Jesus Christ himself had disciples who carried his message out to the world and, and now we are the disciples of Christ as we 
follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe upon Him, we preach His holy word, we are human agents of the King of Kings. Well, also on the dark side, there are human agents or disciples of Satan. I do believe at the highest echelons, these people who recognize they are serving a dark spiritual force. But the henchmen, the little worker bees at the bottom, they don't understand that. They're simply being moved along by the lower level demonic realm saying this is a wise thing, this is good, this is something you want to do to, to move forward into a one world government. So uh, we wrestle against these powers, against the rulers of the darkness, the darkness of this world. You see, the demonic realm manipulates humanity in spiritual darkness. And of course, when you're walking in darkness, you don't know where you're going. That's the essence of darkness. And so the demonic realm must always operate in a veiled secrecy. They cannot let you know what their true intentions are. They're keeping everyone in the dark. Okay, so again, we're looking at the spiritual winds that are causing the events on the surface of the earth to transpire that we see in the news every day. Now turn over to 1 John chapter 4. I don't know, I did get that in there. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And this is where from the spiritual realm, okay, we, now this is the transfer from the spiritual realm where we are interfacing with humanity. And this is where that link is established. In 1 John chapter 4, verses uh, you know what, I got 1 John chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. Actually, I'm going to go back to verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1 through 5. The scripture reads, Beloved, believe not every spirit. So that's the first thing. Hey, don't be gullible. Don't believe every spirit. Okay, well how do I do that? How do I hear a spirit? How do I gauge that? No pun intended, Gage. Yeah. <laughs> None taken. Good. It says, but try or test the spirits. Test the spirits whether or not they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. The first thing we've got to understand is, how do I believe a spirit? I don't understand this. Well, a spirit is what animates a false prophet. A prophet of God is animated by the Spirit of God. A false prophet is animated and speaks out of a fallen spirit, a demonic spirit. Okay? So prophets come and when they speak something to you, it's a spiritual exchange. It comes from their heart, the inward man, and the words come out. And if it's, if it's satanic, it's going to bind you in darkness and deception. Okay, And so it says, test the spirits, because notice this, many false prophets are gone out into the world. We must realize that the ratio of a false prophet to the ratio of the true prophet is at least 400 to 1. And how do I get that number? Because that's how many false prophets Elijah had to deal with at Mount Carmel. So I'll take that number. A 400 to 1, 400 false prophets to the one true prophet. Okay? And they're anywhere. You, you, you throw a stick anywhere, you're going to hit a false prophet somewhere. Okay? There's that, they're there all over the place. Well, how do we test though? How do we distinguish? Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So what are they saying about Jesus Christ? Now, when, when we say this, even the false prophet will take those words and say, oh, well, I believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. But when you dig a little bit deeper, you find that they do not mean the same thing as what this book means. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, this book is the standard. It's not Ron Tabor. It's not any one human being with their name. It is this book, which is the sum total of all the Word of God. This book is the Word of God. And what this book reveals about Jesus the Messiah is the standard. 
And so a false prophet will come and they will not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That spirit is not of God. Gage. Yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, straight from the book. Uh -huh. Because even when I'm thinking about something that may be true, I go straight to the Word of God and, and it's boom. It's like it shows me from, from self the truth and then from what's not, from false. Yeah. Even from myself when I'm thinking, you know. And then and it's like boom, truth right there. It's written. It's not changed. Mm -hmm. And it will protect us from lies and falseness. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. This is the standard. And oh, by the way, I didn't write this book. I don't make money off this book. Nope. Now, normally, you'll find the false prophets, they have a financial investment in the sale of books and products and so forth. And we've got to be aware, even within the body of Christ, within Christendom, you have false prophets, false teachers that rise up and they sell books and books. And usually you can spot them because they're flying in Learjets and they... They uh, have uh, multi-hundred million dollar mansions, and uh, they're, they're always selling, uh, uh, you know, I need you to give, 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 you know, it's always centered on giving and all this nonsense. But anyway, the, the acid test is, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. So the spirit of Antichrist is already present working in the world today. The, the actual man who is the Antichrist has not been revealed yet. But the spirit of Antichrist is already at work preparing and shepherding and herding the world to that crescendo moment where they will receive the man of sin. Okay? So just as Jesus is the good shepherd, He leads us beside still waters, He gives His sheep eternal life, He's the good shepherd. The Antichrist is the, sh like, I call Him the shepherd of the dead. Those who do not know Christ, and He is herding them to ultimate eternal destruction in the lake of fire. And we can test the spirit of Antichrist is that He will not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now again, with a biblical definition of who is Jesus? Yeshua. Yeshua, the Hamashiach, the Messiah, the Anointed One, is come in the flesh. He is God in human flesh. See, when you start probing with the biblical definitions, you'll quickly find you'll separate the sheep from the goat. You'll separate the wheat from the chaff because the spirit of Antichrist will never agree to these things. They may use the same phraseology, but if you just listen long enough, you say, okay, you're preaching another Jesus. Or you're denying Him overtly and outright. Okay? Okay, so, so that's the standard. Now it says, you are of God, little children. You have overcome them. Now who's the them? It's the false prophets and the spirit of Antichrist. You have overcome them, and greater, because greater is He that is in you, than he that is in the world. So the Spirit of God resides in us. And what does the Spirit of, of God do inside the children of God? He guides them into all truth. That's His work. He glorifies Jesus Christ. Look at what we just read. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Amen. That's the Spirit of God that speaks out of our mouth. We cannot deny these truths. Hey, look, my life might be a wreck. I might have a lot of problems going on in my life. But I'm born again, and the test, the acid test of the Spirit coming out of my mouth is, it's going to echo the truths of the Scripture. Amen. And the other Spirit is going to say, Amen, when it hears the truth of the Spirit coming out of the mouth of a, of a prophet of God. Okay? So, we are of, uh, we are of God, little children. You, you've overcome them, the false prophets, the Antichrist, because greater is He that is in you than He is in the world. We can never be taken to a point of unbelief in the Lord Jesus Christ because greater is He that's in us than He that's in the world. They, now listen to this. This is the verse I want to get to. They, the Antichrists, the false prophets, they are of the world. Okay? And remember, the world is governed by the prince of the power of the air and the spirit of Antichrist. That is the wind that blows through the hearts of the members of the world. Okay? They are of the world, therefore speak they. 
What's coming out of their mouth? I don't care what orphanage they go to and, and hold a baby and put a spoon of food in his mouth and have their picture taken, and then they fly off to, you know, to the Bahamas for a, a, a two-month vacation. What are they speaking? What comes out of their mouth? So it says, Therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. The world hears them. This is the test. Now notice this, it says, Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So here's what happens. The spirit of Antichrist compels a man, raises him up, and he speaks. He's a false prophet. This is his gig. I go around and, t and tell you the things of God. Uh, Rob Bell is one, a case in point. Oh, there's no such hell, place as hell. Love wins. In fact, now I'm getting to the point, I don't even use the Bible anymore. Everything comes out of his mouth reveals that he is speaking by the spirit of Antichrist. And you know who he always gets an audience with? Miss Oprah Winfrey. Oh, Rob Bell, it is so great to have you here. I just love your newest book. Uh, I'm good, you're good, we're all going to heaven. I just love that book. Uh, and millions and millions of people applaud the false prophet. They applaud, the, they'll fill stadiums and, and basketball stadiums to hear the wise prophet speak. And of course, they'll buy his books and give him money and put get fuel in his Learjet, all this stuff. Look, if you've got a guy whose name is Creflo Dollar and he's preaching, you, that should be your first clue. Creflo Dollar is the first clue. I don't need to be under this man's teaching. Okay, so these are the spiritual winds, but it's the spirit of Antichrist that speaks. That's the speaking spirit. And now the spirit that receives that message is the spirit of error. It's the spirit of error. Has an ear tuned for lies and deception. It's a spirit of error. Okay? Now, what's the opposite? Well, the spirit of truth, the spirit of God. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses out of their mouth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, that spirit is from God. And again, applying biblical definition to the terms. Okay? That spirit is of God that's compelling that man to speak. And it's going to be in harmony with this book. Okay? It's not going to be in harmony with the other books, but with this book, the Bible, the Word of God, the canon of Scripture. Okay? Okay? And the ear that says amen is the spirit of truth. Okay, so it's like this. When I send out a, 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 a link or, or anyone since shares a link and it's a pastor, I listened to one, Bill, uh, Devor, I think it was Devore Truth. He was speaking on our doubts, that sermon. I listened to that. Really good sermon. He's talking about Moses and the staff and, and, and how God reassured Moses when he was having a, a season of doubt. And it was good. And so we have the same spirit. Bill and I have the same spirit. We, we, we enjoy the Word of God. We recognize it. Our ear is tuned to it. And we share these things. We're having communion or fellowship around the Word of God. Okay? We're not having fellowship around my latest best-selling book or, oh yeah, this is the Bible. This is the Bible, but I had to correct a lot of it. So I've got the Ron Tabor version, the Ron Tabor. The RTV is going to be out here in the foyer. And for only a donation of $50 or more, you can get the RTV. Now, if you want me to sign your RTV, the Ron Tabor version of the Bible, uh, that will be another uh, $150. And I will sign it for you right here. And for $200, I'll give you the pen that I touch. Oh, okay, that should be an indication okay. of a false prophet, right? Okay. We don't miss any of Kenny's, Kenny's uh, programs, do we? Any what programs? Mr. Copeland? <laughs> That's right. I got a few of that lyrics yet. Yeah. But, but these are the spirits that are moving the, the pieces on the table of the world. So the spirit of error will listen, okay, to the spirit of Antichrist. And so this is a very important gauge, okay? When you step back and say, man, in this world, it's very, a, a lot of confusion, right? There's a lot of, a lot of contradictory information going on out there. So what is wise to do is to stand back and say, okay, what is the world doing? What direction is the world being shepherded into? 
Who are the key players that are emerging as leaders of the world in this pandemic situation? And once you see the general shift in a general direction of the world, then you can say, that is a lie. They are pursuing error. So I need to step back and say, Lord, show me the truth. And we can know the truth. And I think it's vitally important, if we want to know the truth in this day, is that we must expose our minds to this book. Because again, you open this book and spiritual light fills the, fills the room. You close this book and you're in spiritual darkness. Like that. And once you close the book, then you can be led anywhere by Satan. Because you're in darkness. And you begin to trust the voices that speak to you. Well, that's everybody else is doing it, so uh, you know, I guess I better do this too. Uh, I don't really... I don't feel good about it, but, you know, whatever. So we've got to be in the light. So these are the spiritual forces. Now let's look at this. This is very, very telling, okay? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. There are three fundamental tools that the devil is using to manipulate the world to welcome the Antichrist. And these are his, his telltale signs, his fingerprints, okay, that indicate that the spirit of error is not only speaking, but now we see manipulating people to do certain things. So look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Now look at this. It says, For as much then, this is speaking of Jesus Christ here, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood... Okay, the children of God, the sons and daughters of God. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He, the Lord Jesus Christ, also Himself, likewise took part of the same. In other words, the Logos of God, the Word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. God, eternal Spirit God, in the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, became flesh. He also took on flesh and blood. Uh, why did he do that? Why did he partake of the same? In order that through death he might destroy him, and that's speaking of the devil, and the word destroy is he neutralize or, or shut him down. He idled the power of Satan. He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the first thing, we're going we're to cover this portion in a, in a second here, but the first part is death. Satan has his ultimate power is, is physical death. That is his ace in the hole. Okay? So what are we looking at right here? We're looking at this pandemic. And, and the pandemic, as I've mentioned before, if someone told you, yeah, you, you really need to shelter in place because uh, this, ooh, I'll tell you what, this, this COVID virus, the COVID virus is so bad. If you get infected with it, your, your nose will uh, run for about a day or two. Oh, it's terrible. Your nose will just stream. No one would be afraid of that. You wouldn't shut down the world for that. No, it is death. The coronavirus is a synonym for death. And it is now a global death that has been unleashed upon the world, or so it's being portrayed, right? Okay, so whenever death is involved as this motivator, you can say, okay, I'm starting to sniff out Satan here. Because who brought death into humanity? It was Satan. He brought sin and death to mankind, right? So he has the power of death. This is his ultimate motivational force in the world. Point number two, you can detect Satan, is by lying. There is deception. Look at John chapter 8, verse 43. John 8, 43. John 8, 43 through 45. Now again, we're looking at the spiritual winds that are moving the, the players on the stage of humanity right now as we're speaking. John chapter 8, verse 40, well, 43 through 45, not 35. So now Jesus is engaging with, with the, the religious leaders, the Jews here in this dialogue. He's speaking to these unbelievers, these leaders of Israel who, 
who have the spirit of error, they don't hear the words of Jesus. Now listen to this. It says, um, why, he's asking them a question, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. This is another test of the spirit of error. I don't get what they're saying. Someone might be watching a video that, that we're producing or even live on Facebook and like laughing and shaking their head. Oh, Ron, this is crazy talk, man. You're crazy, Ron. You've gone crazy. And they will think that of us. Why? Because the majority, the overwhelming majority is following the spirit of Antichrist. And why are you saying it's the devil? Oh, I'm the devil, you know? They're going to think we're insane. Okay? This is what's going to unfold. Prepare yourself you're going to be viewed as mentally ill. And it's going to start to be manifest, why won't you take the COVID vaccination? Are you crazy? Don't you see how many people are dying from this and you obstinately refuse to take this? Are you insane? Well, fortunately, because of House Resolution 6666, I'm not making that up, House Resolution 6666, we now have the authority to take you, okay, to take you with us in a, a, a safe to a safe environment <laughs> where we can persuade you of, of the foolishness of your ways. You'll take the vaccine. This is, this is just introductory here. Um, so he says, you cannot hear my word. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. You see, the world says, oh, we're all children of God. No, we're not. Jesus just said very clearly, there are two types of people in the world. The children of God, those who have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and are born again, adopted sons and daughters of the Almighty, and there are those who have not believed in Jesus Christ, and they are the children of the devil. The spiritual children of the devil. Okay? You are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. So notice this. The children of the devil do the lusts of the devil. It's instinctive. It's their nature. See, when they hear their father speak a lie, to them it's the truth. Because it comes from the spiritual father. The father of lies. And he speaks a lie to his children. And the children believe it. And oh, by the way, they say, the children of the devil have the same passions as Satan has. You know, when I was unsaved, I loved wickedness. I relished in evil. My heart was planning and scheming how I could spend my money and achieve more evil, wicked pleasure. And notice here, this is what he says. Uh, he says, uh, uh, verse 44, The lust of your father he will do, listen to this, he was a murderer from the beginning. So we see that the work of Satan is death and murder. This is his objective for humanity. Now does he come out and tell the world, follow me and I'll be sure and slaughter you quickly? Of course not. Is it, what did he do to Eve? He deceived her. He made what would bring death, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He made it look like something desirable. Oh, you want it. This is the very first piece of fruit you want to eat is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he used deception and made what was, would bring her death, he made it look like it brought her life. In fact, he said, you'll be like God. You eat this, you're not going to die, you're going to be like God. And so Satan is moving humanity to a point of, of global slaughter. That's what he's doing right now. Okay, Because he is a murderer. Now, does, he never comes on as a murderer. He comes as an angel of light, right? He appears as an angel of light with smiling white teeth and, and eloquent speech. But ultimately he is a murderer. Okay? Now right now as we look at the world, the world is being now converted into a global government. The, the, the globalists, the elites, are executing their plan to usher in Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, a one world government. Uh, they have longed for this. Why? Because the spiritual father wants a one world government. Well, how do we know that? Well, because you go back to the flood 
And that's what Satan was doing, was bringing together a one-world government under the leadership of Nimrod. And God came down and confounded the languages and broke up that one-world government. Well, this time he's going to allow it to come together, not around Nimrod, but around the Antichrist, the, the false messiah. He will pretend to be a, a, a savior, someone who will bring peace and solution to the world's problems, but in fact he is, he is the Antichrist, he's the false Christ, and his objective is murder and death. Okay, but the first thing, notice, death is what is manipulating the world today to agree. I mean, what will cause a man to shutter his business and, and, put, and strangle his, his source of income? But death itself. And we see it on a global basis now. Uh, the next one is uh, lies. We talked about the lies. Okay, uh, I don't think I finished this passage here. Uh, when he speaks a lie, when the devil speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, out of his own heart. For he is a liar and the father of it. You see, so anytime Satan has a communication to mankind, whether it be through a dream or a vision or a, a false prophet, it will be a lie. But it will appear to be the truth. Well, how do you distinguish it? Run it through the filter of this book. If you have this book closed, you will believe the lie. If you have this book open, then you can test what, you, what, the, what spirits are communicating to you, and you can discern the lies from the truth. Okay? Um, so he speaks of, of a lie, and then Jesus says, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. See, Jesus spoke the truth to a bunch of brood of vipers who were the children of the devil, and when his truth words struck the ear of, of the children of the devil, they said, ah, 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 that's not true. Because in their heart, the spirit of error said, no, that's not true. It contradicts what our spiritual father is telling us. The devil. So, so we can understand the spiritual nature and the spiritual battle of what's going on here. So Satan will compel people with death. He will compel people to act with lies. And finally, fear. These are his three tools, three fundamental tools that he uses to manipulate mankind. So back over to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse... Um, 14, 15. Uh, the word says, um, So Jesus uh, partook of flesh and blood uh, in order that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, which is the devil. And, and the devil has been defanged. The Lord Jesus Christ crushed his head at Calvary. When Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, He defeated Satan, not only defeated him, but ground his head into the earth. So Satan does not want people to hear the gospel because then they realize that Satan has no more power over them. There's, people can be set free from the fear of death uh, and, and, and torment in the lake of fire. Okay? And deliver them, verse 15, and Christ would deliver them who through fear of death, now notice this, through the means of the fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And as I was thinking through this, we just saw, we're having our little movie thing going on, and we watched The Call of the Wild. What was the name of that dog? It was Buck? What was the name of that dog? Buck. Okay, so this call, this, this dog, it's kind of cha it, it, it kind of chronicles this dog's Life. adventures in Alaska. It's a really cool movie. And, uh, but there's a scene where Buck has gotten loose and he's been captured. He's a big dog, a strong dog. He'd fetch a good penny as, a, as a, a sled dog in Alaska. So someone stole the dog and now they sell him. Well, when Buck was in their little cage and they were training him, the, the, the new master had a stick. And Buck came out first and he came out of the cage. He's growling, you know, you're not my master. And he pulled out that stick and he put it in his face. He said, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And he reared back with that stick. He's going to smite the dog. And Buck, which was a big dog, he cowered back like this in submission to his master. Mm -hmm. Why? It was because of that stick. Right. The yeah. stick was the power that caused that big dog to yield. Mm -hmm. Satan has a stick of fear, the fear of death. 
And Satan is drawing it back to the world and says, you better do what I say through my people or you're going to die. When in fact he's marshalling everyone to kill them. But through fear he says, you better obey or you're going to die. And what has what humanity said? Okay, okay. Close my business? Okay. Don't go out anywhere? Okay. Stay in my home? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Because there's death and there's the fear of death out there. And so the world is submitting to this. And look, folks, God bless President Trump, but if he's not saved, he has no option but to yield to these spiritual forces. He may have an understanding of the economy, but when this stick is raised back, and he's the responsible party for the United States, he's going to yield to their will. It's time for us to start distancing ourselves from President Trump and our support of him in, in a, you know, a rah-rah way. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I don't even know if we'll have an election, honestly. But I'm not saying that between him and, you know, whoever else, you don't vote for him. I'm saying we, we need to... We need to be very careful and, and start to separate because he very clearly is moving in a direction that is subordinative, subordinated to the global elites, the satanic cabal that's, that's running the show. Okay? So our Lord is Jesus Christ, right? We serve Christ. We follow Christ. And when Trump departs from a path of, of, of doing things that are beneficial, then we say, goodbye, Mr. President. We can no longer support you. Um... So, so Satan used death and lies and fear. Now, folks, if this coronavirus pandemic scare, if you cannot see that death and fear and lies are the motivating forces that are manipulating the entire world to strangle out their economy, to destroy the industry of their nations, then you might want to examine... <laughs> What spirit am I listening to? Because it's patently obvious what's going on here. Okay? Uh, I looked at the figures today. There are over three, there's 3.2 million uh, residents in the state of Utah. 75 have died from coronavirus. Out of 3.2 million citizens, and we put a tourniquet on everything, on our liberties, on, the, on the, the industry, on the economy, because 75 people out of this state. Now, I know there are more, it's, it's more and less in other states. The point is simply, death and lies and fear are motivating the governor, are motivating the, the city council representatives. I went to the playground the other day as naughty pastor. I took my grandchildren to the playground the other day, and it was roped off with tape. Don't you play on this playground. Don't you play on this playground. You'll die if you play on this playground. It's foolishness what's going on. And probably because I was there, they'll say, oh, we'll fix that. And they'll put up uh, electrified fence around the playground. You know, you're not going to play in this playground. <laughs> so, so anyway, these are the spiritual winds that are compelling us to bow to what otherwise would be an insane proposition. And now it makes sense. Now, now get this here, okay? The, the lies and the fear. I was, in a, I was in a grocery store the other day, and I walked out with this lady. She had her cart, and, and she, was, she had a mask on, and it was interesting, because now we're at the point now. I walked in that store. I was the <laughs> odd man out without a mask. Uh -huh. I knew. Uh, again, it looked like a surgical ward. Everybody had a mask on. <laughs> So, so I'm walking through there, and I walk out with this lady, and she's like, oh, what do I do with this cart? And I said, well, you can probably just, just leave it here, you know, they'll take care of it. And uh, she had her mask on, and, and I said, you know, this whole thing is, is a deception. I mean, yes, the virus is real. I'm not saying it's not real, but I'm saying it's been overblown of a magnitude greater fear than it really merits. Um, I looked at the Black Plague. The Black Plague mm -hmm. in five years. Now this is this is where you want to wear your mask, okay? Mm -hmm. The Black Plague killed 20 million people in Europe alone. Not globally, in Europe alone. It was one-third the population of Europe was killed by the Black Plague. 
And I mean, it was horrifying, terrible. So, I, yeah, I would wear my mask in the Black Plague, okay? Uh, but anyway, I, I said, you know, this is being really overblown, and this is, this is designed to destroy the United States and, and give a one-world government. And she said, oh, you don't want to get this virus. She talked about a family member who was a physician and everything. And, oh, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible virus and death. And, you know, realistically, I don't think there's any death that's pleasant, first of all. Um, but secondly, you could tell that this woman was being controlled by fear. Now, I'm not saying that she should take her mask off. She was an elderly woman. I understand that. But mentally, she had been prepared. She had believed the spirit, death, lies, and fear, were dominating her thinking and therefore her behavior. Yeah. I was talking to my doctor about it because I had a meeting with him there, General with Bone. Yeah. And uh, I think, honestly, do you think this is serious? I mean, I was like, come on. And the way he said it to me was like, he was being paid to say it, you know, because he was, the way he was telling me, he's like, well, the reason why it's so bad is because if you get it, not because you get it, but if you pass it on to, let's say, your parents, it, dealt, it raises, raises the risk of that dying. But he didn't say the percentage of it. Sure. Then he says, and if they pass it on to their parents, your grandparents, then they have a higher risk of dying. Yeah. But the thing is, is it doesn't multiply as you pass it. So I don't know why he was saying that. Like what? What he was saying, I know it was. It was you know, like he was paid to say it. Yeah. And it was ridiculous. Well, I I, I was able to go to my ENT appointment. Thank you, Virginia, again uh -huh. for your input. Come on, I know. Uh, I went in there and they scoped me with no problem. They didn't even bat an eye. I wasn't afraid. It was all good. Nice. I had a great. It's like praise <laughs> God, I got to see an actual doctor. I was not afraid. Nice. And I remember I spoke to the to the receptionist. I said, I'm so glad you're open. You know, I tried to get an appointment with McKD, and they are closed. That was back in March. I had a phone consultation. You can't tell anything over the phone. And da 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 da, and I so said, I'm glad I'm here. And when I said McKady, she rolled her eyes like this, like, they are crazy what they're doing, shutting down everything. And so, I mean, it's it's a fact that people are dying by other causes because they're afraid to go to the hospital to be seen yeah. for a heart attack, chest pains, and whatever. Yeah. They're saying, I ain't going in there because I don't want to die. Well, you're going to die now from a heart attack <laughs> if you don't get in there. So, so this is having you know this effect. But again, death lies in fear. That's why you couldn't see the doctor. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, because we are seeing this global manipulation of these things. Uh, we can recognize, because the motivating factor are death, lies, and fear, we can pinpoint the spiritual source of what's happening. As God continues to lift His hand, Satan is now having more freedom, because again, isn't this unprecedented? Has the world ever shuttered everything as an entire entity? This has never happened before. And, and granted, we've got the communication, etc., but nevertheless, even with the modern communications, with, with pandemics that have killed more people than the coronavirus. We didn't shut the world down. But now, see, the hand of God has lifted a little bit higher, and Satan now has a little bit more freedom to do more things on a global scale. Okay? So now we're going to, for the final 20 minutes here, we're going to look at, we're going to start touching on the material things, the things that we can see, and we can start to categorize these events. Now, I, I put these together out of the passages in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And these are the global birth pangs. Now remember, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is with his disciples. And uh, this is the uh, Sermon on uh, no, not the Sermon on the Mount. This is the, uh, it's not the Olivet Discourse, Discourse. What is this one? I can't remember the, f the formal name of this. But anyway, Jesus is dialoguing with the disciples. Uh, Jesus says, Matthew 24, verse 2, Jesus said unto them, okay, let me back up. I'll read verse 1 as well. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, 
There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So they're walking across the temple compound and they're, they're pointing out to the beautiful temple that Herod had, had remodeled, this extraordinary uh, place of worship. And Jesus says, that building, not one stone will be left upon another. It's going to be destroyed. And of course, that was fulfilled in A.D. 70 when the Romans came through under General Titus and destroyed Jerusalem and leveled the, the Temple Mount and destroyed the temple, and the gold of the temple seeped, it melted in the heat of the fire, seeped into the cracks, and they removed stone by stone, every stone to scrape the gold off. That's what the Romans did. And you can read that in, in, the, um, in Joseph, the writings of Josephus. So his word was fulfilled. Now the disciples asked the question, three fundamental questions that begin, yeah, it's on the Mount of Olives, the Olivet Discourse, that's it, Olivet Discourse. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? Okay? Those three fundamental questions. When will these things be? What is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And then Jesus tells them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay. So before the end comes, he says... Before the end comes, there's going to be these events that are, he calls the beginning of sorrows or the, the birth pangs like of a woman. And we've talked about this in the past where as a woman gets closer and closer to the moment of delivering the child, mm -hmm. the pains and the convulsion intensify. They get more fast, more rapid, and a stabbing pain. More pain, 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 more pain. It's faster and more intense pain up to the moment that she delivers the child. And so now Jesus gives these seven things. I went, I went, I used all the Gospels and brought the text of all the Gospels together to put this list together. These are the birth pangs that we will, we can anticipate experiencing. And I want to go through them and I want to break them down and make application to today. The first one is world war. And that comes from nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We've talked about before how that is a Jewish idiom for global conflagration or in, uh, an engulfing an entire warfare. In this context, it is World War. Of course, the first World War began in 1914. And so, technically, the, the age of the birth pangs began in 1914. Okay, With World War I, then followed by World War II, 1941, uh, 1941 to 1945. Okay, so World War, and then we have famine. Number two is famine. Hey, Steve. Hi, how are we doing? Good. Good. We're making on time? <laughs> Just time for the closing prayer. Yeah. So <laughs> says Yeah. So, so here, Steve, we're looking at the birth pangs here, and just trying to, the objective here is to put the events that we're seeing on the news into a category, these seven categories uh, of events that Jesus said would come before the end of the age. All right? And so the first one is world war. The second one it says famine. Famines. And the word famine means scarcity of food. Scarcity of food. Hmm. Scarcity of food. Uh, somebody look at Acts chapter 7 verse 11. Can someone read that? Uh, and I will flip over to Acts 11, 28, 29. Now, I want, I'm going to look at these passages. They talk about famines in history, and we can, we can draw some truth out of how the famine affected the people. So Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 11, and I'll look at 11, 28, 29. And now there came a birth okay. what? over all the land. Of Egypt. And what is that? Canaan. Canaan. 
Yeah. And great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. Okay. The word dearth is the Greek word that's translated famine. It's a synonym. So he's speaking. This is uh, this is uh, Stephen. He's preaching. He's about to be the first Christian martyr, and he's speaking back to the days uh, of uh, of Joseph and when the the found the or the, the fathers of Israel, the, the twelve tribes, and Jacob, they went over and and were they found shelter in Egypt under their the protection of Joseph. Now there came a dearth or a famine over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. Okay, we are entering a phase in the United States of America of famine. The grocery stores are slowly, slowly, the shelves are slowly, slowly shriveling and emptying. I would not be surprised very soon if they block off certain aisles and consolidate things into fewer aisles. Okay? So that yeah. we're, you know, you're not spread out to get one can of beans here. They can move it in, you know. But the point simply is, we are witnessing the beginning phases of famine. Now again, if you go to Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, this is all part of the plan. They want to move us into centralized cities with multiple millions of, uh, of human beings in these mega cities, living in these stack them and pack them uh, high towered concrete uh, sarcophagi, growing our vegetables on the trellis with solar panels for power, capturing rainwater that falls on top of the of, of the big building and trickles all the way down to provide all of our water needs. This is what they want us to do. And I used to think it was just as insane as, as you're listening to me now. This is what they are doing. This is global communism with a fancy name. Sustainable development. Okay? They're not going to tell you we want to move in and, and reduce the world population from 7 billion to 500 million or 1 billion. Okay, They're not going to tell you that. But now we're facing famine. Now look at this. So, so we can project our own mind. This is what we can expect. They had no sustenance. They had no sustenance. They found no sustenance. In other words, they were in want. Church, we are not promised to be removed before the famine starts to affect our stomachs. Okay? We must be sober-minded and say we may face a season of stomach hunger and pain and having lack. And I'll tell you what, we start to see this frustration as particularly people on a fixed income and they go into the store and the prices are going up and the things they need are not there and they really need it. And now they've got to go to a second store, a third store, a fourth store to try and cobble together their needs where before they could just go into one store. Right. Now we need to thank God right now, at least if you do go to three or four stores, you can cobble together what you need. But we need to prepare ourselves for no sustenance, hunger pains, it's going to affect us. Okay, We're not promised that the rapture is going to remove us from this time. Okay, now go over to Acts chapter 11. Now look at this, this is a great verse. Acts chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Now remember again, there's our satanic winds that are blowing. Satanic winds are now moving the pawns of Satan on the chessboard, and these pawns are now pushing this agenda onto humanity. And uh, Acts chapter 11, uh, verse 28 and 29 says, And there stood up one of them, so these prophets, the prophets had come to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem unto Antioch, which was really the, 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 the main hub of activity for the body of Christ at this point in, in Acts. It was Antioch. There stood up one of them, one of these prophets stood up, his name was Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great famine or dearth, a famine throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Notice this in verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren 
which dwelt in Judea. So think about this. A prophet has said there's going to be a famine over the world. It's going to come. And what did the disciples do? They decided we're going to minister to one another's need. We're going to take up a collection offering and minister to the saints in Judea. And folks, here is our roadmap as the body of Christ at Grace Bible Ministries that we need to be sensitive to one another's needs and ready to the best of our ability to support one another in that time of need. So th I thought this was a great picture of the church responding in a very practical way to the needs of the body of Christ when there is famine. Okay. All right, let's look at, uh, look at Luke 15. Again, we're looking at the effects of famine and how human nature responds to it. Luke chapter 15. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Luke 15, 14 through 17. Luke 15, 14 through 17. Now this is speaking of the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son. It says, and when he had spent all, so he's in the faraway country, he's got, he got daddy's inheritance early, he's out there living large, throwing cash, you know, prostitutes, meals, drunkenness, this is a great life. Well, then you know what happens eventually? You burn through your inheritance and you're broke. <laughs> and so this has happened to him. And uh, he says, uh, And when he had spent all of his money, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Now listen to this. He began to be in want. Folks, we are in the phase, we are in the early phases of beginning to be in want. Jana ordered something online. And now this is a trivial thing, but it's, it's, it's reflective of this phase we're in. Jana ordered something online. How many weeks have you been waiting now? Two weeks. Now fortunately, it's not a food product that we've got to have this to, to keep functioning, or medicine. It was just some garment. But this is now reflective of the entire supply chain. Breaking down. Every day the supply chain is breaking down. As businesses close and now truckers, they don't have loads to share. Now what? What used to take 100 truckers to move the freight, now it only takes 50 truckers. Well, guess what? That means there are 50 truckers now who have been cut out of money. Their, their, their career is done. And now they can't buy anything. And now the trucking supply, the, the supply chain is breaking down. We see it in the grocery stores. I heard uh, uh, John Haller said he knows an owner of a, uh, what was it? Uh, it was, uh, I think it was a Burger King in Ohio. And they've already restricted their menu. And the guy said, headquarters told me not to expect a truck for 14 weeks. Hmm. That store is closed. Yeah. They're done. So we're they. So here, this guy, he began to be in want. That's where we're at right now. Our st I ate, I had dinner before I came. I'm full. But we're going to enter into this phase more and more to be in want. And he went. Notice this compels him. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. You see, he's still operating in the foolish mode of. I want to eat, drink, and be merry, and I don't want to go back to my father's house. I want to live in the faraway country, and maybe I can make enough money and I can start having my friends come back over. Because for some reason, when the money is gone, now my friends are gone too. I guess, I guess they got busy with other things, but maybe I can keep this going. I'll get a job here. I'll attach myself to some of the world. And see, that's what the temptation of the church is today, to join ourselves to someone of the world. Well, I, maybe he knows what to do. I'll, I'll, hey, Bob, what are you doing? I'm going to get my vaccine. You want to come with me? Well, okay, I guess I will. I'll follow the crowd of the world. I'll join them and go and, and yield myself to the world. That's what the prodigal did at first. He joined himself. Instead of, instead of waking up earlier, well, I guess I'll go hang out with this guy. He's got work for me. He went and joined uh, himself to a citizen of that country. He went with him into his field to feed the swine. <laughs> That's where the world's going to take you every time. You're going to wind up feeding pigs and ultimately death. Now, if this guy, if he didn't wake up, he was going to die of starvation here. It says, and he would fain, he, 
he, would, he was longing to have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Now notice this degree of hunger. I'm ready to eat my right arm here. I'm getting seriously hungry. Now imagine, again, Satan with his stick of fear, he's putting the noose of hunger upon the United States that doesn't really know what hunger is. I mean, any time any human being in the United States of America is hungry, there is a banquet to feast on somewhere in, the, in that town. There's a food bank, there's something to eat somewhere. Well, now in the United States of America, who has never known hunger, we're going to start to experience hunger and empty cabinets, and it's going to affect our thinking. Okay, it's going to push us, if we're not walking with Christ, it's going to push us to things that we're, we're going to see down here later on in these birth pangs. They're going to manifest themselves. Okay, so notice that. Uh, no man gave him to eat. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants... Let's see, where do I cut this off at? Verse 17. How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to eat, to spare? And I perish, listen to this, I perish with hunger. Do you want to know how to make a nation, a constitutional republic, surrender their freedoms without even batting an eye? You bring them to their knees with starvation and hunger. And then you dangle the carrot in front of them say you want the carrot yeah 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 okay here's what we're gonna do now we're gonna change the way you live your life and the way you used to be governed and the freedoms you used to enjoy I perish with hunger so notice he went from the stage of he began to be in want to the point of destitution I am starving to death I've got to do something now I'm ready to eat my right arm to survive now of course in this case he came to his senses and went back to his father's house but we are in the days and the spiritual winds are blowing is we're going to rush into the arms of the Antichrist as he rises up to lead this new one world government. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop there on point number two. And we'll pick back up next, Lord willing, next month. But again, I, I want as these things start to unfold, take this handout and, uh, and you can begin to catalog news events. <laughs> Look at it through the prism of death, lies, and fear. What am I hearing? Is it death, lies, and fear? Okay, that's of Satan. Now help me to catalog this. Where is this going? Okay, where do I catalog it in the birth pangs that we've described here? Now one of them, I, want, I, want to get, I really wanted to get to number five tonight. This is a big one. Troubles. This is found in Luke chapter 10, verse, verses, uh, uh, excuse me, Luke 21, verse 10 and 11. Troubles. It means a disturbance, a roiling, as of a mob, and sedition. Sedition. These are some of the birth pangs that we're going to see in the last days. It's number five, the word troubles. It's found in Luke 21, verses 10 and 11. And it means a disturbance, a roiling up, as of a mob, and sedition. And sedition, listen to this. Sedition defined is... Overt conduct such as speech or organization that tends toward insurrection against an established order. Uh, sub sedition includes subversion of a constitution and incitement of discontent or resistance against established authority. Essentially what we can expect is the decay of political cohesion and leadership and a subversion of the constitutional republic causing boiling conflict in the nation. It starts to boil, boil and clash, boil and clash, boil and clash as these troubles magnify. And until finally the republic collapses and the Antichrist, or the one worlders, can say, We have a solution. So we'll get into that in greater detail uh, next, next month, Lord willing. So let's close with prayer. Father, we, we are grateful, God, for your word. We're grateful, God, for the blessed hope because, Lord, as we read these, these things and we see these things in the headlines, uh, it's very disturbing, honestly. It's, it's a fearful thing were it not for the fact that we are going to our Father's house. Thank you, Father. Just as the prodigal came to himself and returned to his Father's house, Lord, you are coming back to receive us unto yourself to take us into our Father's house. 
Lord, we thank you that you'll deliver us from the wrath to come through the rapture of the church. But Lord, please help us in the meantime, God, as we face these things, as you leave us down here, Lord, for your purposes until the precise moment of deliverance. Let us be faithful. Let us see things through the prism of your word and not be fearful. And God, help us to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to as many as we can, Lord, that they too might participate in the blessed hope that they might be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, God, that they might receive the free gift of eternal life. We love you, God. We praise you and thank you for your word and your promises. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.